Hello everybody, welcome into our latest live video, which you will see here in just one second. There I am. Today it is Tuesday, the 23rd of July, 2024. My name is Kerry Holzman, and our thanks to our friends at Acronis True Image. Yes, they brought back the name True Image uh, instead of Acronis, Acronis Cyber Protect Home. It's back to Acronis True Image. That 30% discount still applies to all of our viewers for the rest of this year. And then we'll talk to Acronis about extending that into next year. Our friends over at RoboForm for password management, 30% off to all of our viewers that are new customers of RoboForm. And our friends at VIP CDK Deals who offer very discounted and legitimate legal license keys for Windows and Office, 30% off for all of our viewers. No obligation, everything as a trial, everything is guaranteed. So um, don't let me pressure you into buying anything. You feel like you can use that, you want a good value and a good product that I endorse, that I use myself, there you go. Speaking of that, you know, we probably see more minis for them, mini PCs than any other brand. Do you know why that is? Well, for a lot of other tech channels, it's because they have a sponsorship arrangement and whoever pays the most gets their products on display. We don't work this channel that way, so we're broke. <laughs> but what we do is we're viewer supported, meaning that the memberships of the people who choose to support us go towards our ability to purchase items that we want to review, that we're free to review at our leisure without any time constraints or approvals or consequences, positive or negative, from the company. And throughout this process, we've had several companies reach out, uh, Minis Forum being one of them, saying, you know, we're not asking for a sponsorship. We're asking for a review. And I'm saying, well, I, I don't have the money to buy the product, right? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money for me to do a review. We'll send you the product. Oh, under what condition? Under the condition you review it. Well, what do you mean under the condition I review it? Just be honest. Introduce our product to your audience on your timeline. We'll provide a link for you and we'll provide the product to you. And that's it, no strings attached. Do you know how rare it is to find a company so confident in their product line that they're willing to do that? And then after we do it, ask if we'll do it again and again and again. And because I do like their products and I do recommend their products, I always tell Minis Forum yes, because I have pretty much loved every product, whether it's the three-in-one tablet the portable monitor, which we haven't even gotten to, a mini PC that runs specifically and solely, if you choose, off of the Ethernet cable, <laughs> power over Ethernet with no power adapter. Uh, they've got machines for budget, they've got machines for mid-range, and they've got high-end machines for serious high-end work. <laughs> Ooh, big sneeze. So whenever I, re whenever I speak to Minis Forum, they almost don't need to finish their sentence before. I'm like, yes, please. And such is the case with this new PC. This is gonna blow your mind, I promise you. You've never seen a mini PC like this before. And, you know, this is the other thing I like about Minis Forum, they're always innovating. A lot of other mini PC manufacturers, they simply buy somebody else's and just rebrand it, right? So it's like the same exact thing with a different name on it. Sometimes it's the same company within. So for example, um, Ace Magic is also Cam Rui. Paladin is also um, Triku. Minis Forum has a, a, a spin-off brand called Codlix, K-O-D-L-I-X. And in fact, we have done one review of a Codlix GD70, and they just came out with the GD90. And I think the Codlix brand, it, I think the focus of that brand is you're getting the Minis Forum quality, but I think you're getting like yesterday's tech. So the Codlix will be 12th gen, for example, or at least the one, the next one coming up, GD90, is a 12th gen. And, and not a slouch by any stretch of the imagination, but not 13th gen, right? And I, I'm just imagining, I don't know for sure, um, that maybe the ideas that we'll put are really... Uh, current stuff under the Minis Forum name, and then as it ages and it becomes um, 
a lot of people they only want the latest and greatest, but you can save a lot of money buying last year's model. And so rather than conflate the Minis Forum brand, I think, and I'm just coming to a, my own sort of conclusion here without any proof, but what I suspect is that by branding it as Codlix, they, became, they become known as more of a value brand. And then Minis Forum also has the value side, but with current processors like the N100, et cetera, on the, on the budget side of things. And I think that's the logic but when a product is exactly the same, like you'll see Ace Magic and Cam Rui, or as I previously mentioned, Triku and Peladin, where the products are identical except in name alone, that part I don't get. So if they're asking me to review the product under one brand name and the exact same product under the only thing that's changed is the brand, I, I, I tend to be a little leery. However, uh, that's not the case with Minis Forum and Codlex, just so you know. If the Codlix was once a Minis Forum brand, that would have been, you know, a year or more ago when, say, the 12th gen was brand new. So anyway, we'll have a Codlix review here coming up. And one of the benefits of Codlix is because they're not so well known, they have to work a little harder to get your money, meaning they have to be more aggressive on their pricing and offer more value. And we'll talk about that. But when you want something different and you want something unique, you want something nobody else you know is likely going to have. There's so many things to pick from, so many unique choices at Minis Forum. And uh, that's one of the things I love about them. And the quality is outstanding. And again, I'm not paid to say any of this. I genuinely enthusiastically feel this way for this brand. And if you were my customer, I would tell you exactly this. Whether you buy it from me or you buy it yourself, I think you're going to be very happy with it if you understand what you're getting for your money. I get this question a lot. What's the best mini PC for gaming? And you know I can't, nobody can answer what the best of anything is. What's the best chocolate bar? What's the best vehicle to drive? What's the best pants to wear? What's the best haircut I should get? In the case of gaming, it depends on the kind of games you're playing. Are they retro games, first-person shooters, esports, RPG, you know, whatever. And then on top of that, what resolution are you playing it at? Are you playing at 1080, 4K? Are you playing on dual monitors? There's just so many variations that define gaming. You know, somebody could say Solitaire is gaming. Somebody could say Flight Simulator is gaming. Is it? So which one's best? Depends what kind of games you play, at what resolution, on how many monitors. And even what version of the game you're playing. So it, it's an impossible question. It's so subjective. However, I think one could pose an argument that when it comes to the best mini PC for gaming as of late July, 2024, nothing is better than this currently. Now, there are other mini PC gaming machines, and we've looked at those, but they mostly all universally run built-in graphics. Minis Forum has introduced uh, the old Nook i7 X7, which is that big book looking, basically it's half a laptop, which has the built-in mobile NVIDIA graphics. And so that's where your limitation is. We can talk about the latest and greatest processors that have the latest and greatest integrated GPUs, which are getting better, and AMDs are better than Intel in that way currently. If you can put a discrete graphics card in, your gaming performance will go through the roof. But to put a discrete graphics card in, you're, you're not going to be able to fit a big graphics card in a little tiny box. So then you have to plug it in externally. So when you add in the cost of the graphics card and you add in the cost of the external uh, GPU connector, along with having a box that has a fast enough interface to plug that into, it's no longer portable. Yeah, and you need a separate power supply to power the graphics card. And your spending combined for the graphics card, the external GPU enclosure, and a powerful enough mini PC, upwards of probably $1,500 plus. That would be my guess. Like, it wouldn't make sense to put a cheap old graphics card in what is otherwise a new mini PC and a new external GPU dock. So, with that in mind, this does not use 
internal processor graphics. This has a proper graphics card. Are you getting excited yet? Let me show you what's in this discrete black box. If we go over to the Minis Forum website, I'm going to show you the page. By the way, thank you to our friend uh, Buster, Peter Laycock there in Scotland. Hello, my friend. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for your continued support, your generosity. As always, I hope you're feeling well today. And of course, our friend Oystein in Norway, Frankie B there in New York, and all of our members in green. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. And uh, we got exciting news coming up with Studio C here real soon. Now, let me switch over to my capture card. I mean, my capture input. Oh, I see a Czechoslovakian, I don't know what the currency is. It's 200 CZK, comes from Owlcatcher. He says, hello from Czech Republic. I'm a software engineer, but being an IT guy has had me being asked to build PCs for friends and family, and your videos have been really helpful to get actual practical info. Thanks and have a nice one. Well, Owlcatcher, thank you so much. I really appreciate your kindness and your support. And Buster had contributed 10 pounds. He says, hello, Carrie and Mara and everyone in the chat. I can only stay for a short time, but I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Right on. Thank you, Buster. We understand you have a life that's allowed. <laughs> I doubt. <laughs> All right. So, and again, hello, everybody in the chat room. Um, let me share with you the product page and show you how Minis Forum is promoting this, and then we'll go from there so we have an idea of what to expect here. This is called the Adam Man G7 PT. That's funny. I've been calling it the GTP7. <laughs> All right, Adam Man G7 PT. Now, you can see it's a bit pricey, right? It's a thousand bucks. That's on sale at a thousand bucks. But wait till you see what you get for a thousand dollars. It's Pretty impressive. And I would challenge any of you to put these parts together yourself from any retail source and tell me if you can get that anywhere near a thousand bucks. All right. So you got a case and a power supply, right? You got a cooler, you got a CPU, you got RAM, you got storage, you got an operating system. Now, at a thousand bucks, you're going to get bare bone. So <clears throat> in a bare bone, different manufacturers have different ways of defining this. Some bare bone systems will come with no RAM and no solid state drive. Some may not include a CPU if it's a socketable CPU. Generally speaking, many PCs use portable CPUs. Now they say they're gonna start shipping these out at the end of next month, the end of August. I don't know if they're shipping yet, but I, they are available for sale. So I think we've got this version here they sent us, if I'm not mistaken. So you're going to get 32 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of uh, NVMe for 200 bucks more. Let me see the side of the box. Uh, 32 gigs and one terabyte. Yeah, that's the version they've sent us. So why, what makes this so expensive compared to other $400 and $500 or even $300 mini PCs we've seen? Well, first of all, you're going to notice it's quite a bit larger. It's got these panels that light up on the side. All right, so what? You know, it's, that's not adding any performance, reliability, or security. People like pretty lights, and so it provides those. But that's not what makes it worth more. What makes it worth more, first of all, you've got a Ryzen 9 7940HX uh, CPU. That's a Zen 4 16-core, 32-thread CPU with a max boost of up to 5.4 gigahertz, for crying out loud. Um, let's scroll down. They've got something they call their cold wave ultra cooling. We'll talk more about how they keep this thing cool as we get to that point. Uh, of course, with the uh, neural processing units, we talk about teraflops, per, you know, trillions of operations per second. Um, the newer chips are all going to have these NPUs. Right now, a lot of AI computing is being done on the servers online. And then they, like if you go to Suno to make a song, suno.com. You can make a song and the AI processes the music and the lyrics on their servers that are way more powerful than your home computer. And then once that's done, then it's available for you to download and play. But if you had a more powerful computer, you could process this locally. So we're getting there. We're just in the infancy of this. 
It's got a space for two, two point, um, two, two NVMe M.2 slots that one is a PCIe 4 and one is a PCIe 5. We have two sticks of RAM or the availability of up to two sticks of DDR5 for a total of 96 gigs. That would be 48 gigs per stick, which I believe is the maximum size you can buy in um, laptop memory, DDR5 laptop memory. But here's where things get really interesting. Did somebody say Wi-Fi 7? Have we seen Wi-Fi 7 on anything in the last year and a half since Wi-Fi 7 came out, let alone a mini PC? I mean, I don't know who needs it, but I will say that if you have a computer like this, somebody with a computer like this is more likely to need Wi-Fi 7 than somebody with a cheaper computer. Look at all the ports we have. We have a display port, an HDMI port. We have three USB 3.2 Gen uh, Type A 3.2 Gen 2 Type A's, three of those. We've got a 2.5 gig Ethernet, and we've got a line out and a mic in separately. I like that. So this is the back of the unit, and you can see it's got a little stand that you can set it up vertically. And then here we've got a dynamic microphone, a power light. Uh, there's some kind of performance mode display. I guess that tells us what this must have different modes. Oh, I guess it does because there's a button to change modes. So probably from performance to economy, right? Depending on uh, how you're using the machine so that way you're not drawing more power or creating more heat when you're just browsing the web. And then on top of having the jacks in the back, you also have a headset jack in the front that can be used as, uh, well, for a headset or for separately a separate microphone or separate headphones. So you've got the ability to hook up your speakers to the back and your headphones to the front. Plus, you've got another Type A USB uh, 3.2 Gen 2 Type A there. And do we have any Type C's? Yeah, we have a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C port here in the back. And a 3.2 Gen 2 Type C port here on the front. It's really well equipped. But wait. I haven't even gotten to the graphics card yet because that's where some of the chunk of change comes in here. Now you'll see it's got an AMD Radeon RX 7600M XT. Now, I understand that some of the CPUs have built-in graphics cards, right? So someone might say, well, is that the graphics that's built into the Ryzen 9? And here's the deal. Um, let's just do this. Let's not wonder. Let's plug it in and let's see what we've got in here. Because in theory, this might have two video cards in it. Think about it. This thing is insane. And then it, this tab here, and by the way, these links are in our video notes. This explains more about the uh, cooling that's being done and how it's being done. There's two versions of the Atom Man. So there's a small cube-like Atom Man with a touchscreen on the front. And then there's the Atom Man that's very different in design that we're looking at today. I don't particularly have much interest about this Atom Man, but you can see that it will plug into an external dock so that you can add a graphics card if you wish to. With a system like this Atom Man, the graphics card in it should be pretty good. It's clearly not the highest end because quite frankly, you'll spend $1,800 to $2,500 just for a high-end graphics card. So, you know, in that case, the computer's basically free. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're dealing with something much higher end on a mini PC than what we're accustomed to seeing. And as far as I can tell, Mini Swarm's the only one that offers this. So let me go back over to camera one. And let me further explain that I have already taken this out of the box yesterday. And so when I show this, when I unbox this, this is not a genuine first time unboxing. I've unboxed it, taken the plastic off of the machine. It's probably got my fingerprints on it because it's black, right? So you're going to see that. You're going to say, hey, he's not unboxing this for the first time. But all I did when I unboxed it was I hooked it up and did all the Windows updates. Well, finished the whole Windows setup, did the Windows updates, did the AMD Adrenaline software update, and then I shut it down and put it all back so that we don't have to sit here waiting on my slow internet connection for that to happen. And I'm happy to report that as I was setting up Windows, it gave me the option to say I don't have an internet connection, which by default, 
Microsoft has, you know, it forces you and you have to hit shift F10 and type OOBE slash bypass NRO. I did not have to do that. So then my second concern is if I don't have to do that, they must have installed an older version of Windows 11, like 22H2, because they introduced that requirement in 23H2. So imagine my surprise when, you know, first of all, I was happy I didn't have to bypass NRO. I don't have an internet connection, tell it twice. I set up a username, we finish the Windows install, I plug it into the internet, I go to download updates and I check my Windows version while I'm waiting. I'm on 23H2. So Mini's form has altered the default Microsoft, uh, which I do personally myself. I'm, I'm good with that. I, wow, I'm very impressed. I did not expect that or see that coming. That tells me the people that are prepping their software know what they're doing. All right, let's unbox it. Next. Now, I imagine when this is officially sold, it won't be in a plain black box. I'm sure they're going to have proper branding on it. When we do these reviews, please understand that sometimes we get prototypes or we get uh, what would be best referred to as maybe a release candidate or a beta nearing the end of, of production where they're, or the start of production, where they say, okay, we think we've got everything nailed with regards to cooling, hardware compatibility, driver issues, all the testing R&D that has to go into prepping a computer for sale. So by the time the reviewers get it, they feel very confident it's ready to go, unless a reviewer finds something. Because this is the last time to catch it before it goes into mass production and they have this chance to make this change without worrying about having to recall a bunch of stuff or potentially soiling their reputation over an oversight. So it's in their best interest to have us review it. It's in our best interest to be able to review it before it's available for you to purchase. In most cases, they're pretty much good to go. There's some minor changes such as the retail packaging. Um, we've seen them where they sent us a card, um, a mini PC that had a one gigabit uh, ethernet port. And on the final product that shipped, it was a two and a half gig ethernet port. These kind of things, you know. So that's why we're not allowed to sell these. These are review samples, not intended for sale and they don't warranty them. So if somebody were to buy it and you had a problem with it, uh, Minis Forum would wanna know where you got it and Minis Forum would probably be upset with the person they sent it to because they didn't want that in the hands of the public. They didn't feel it was ready yet. And now the public may be misjudging their quality if something should go wrong. And the public might be upset at the lack of customer service when they find out what they bought wasn't supposed to be sold. So be wary of any content creators that sell the stuff they get sent. They're often breaking the terms of their agreement with the manufacturers. And if the manufacturers were aware of it, I'm sure they'd put it to a stop. It's not a legal thing or an illegal thing. It's just an agreement. And if you violate the agreement, I don't think the company is going to be too incentivized to want to send you any more stuff if it potentially embarrasses them. And whether that's because the content creator is ignorant of it or hasn't read through or understood the terms and conditions, or sometimes the manufacturers don't care, but it depends. A lot of times they do care. And a lot of times it's implied that you wouldn't do that. But anyway, you know, it's not for me to decide what people do, but if you're wondering what happens to this stuff, you know, we're allowed to keep it, we're allowed to use it, we can give it to a friend, but we can't sell it. All right, let's take a look here. That, that's pretty much true. If any company sends me anything, unless it's intended to be given out, well, even if it's intended, I can't sell that either, right? I mean, that's an ethical violation. Um, yeah, unless I have specific instruction from the company otherwise, that's the default. Those are the default terms and conditions of... Uh, getting the product for review. All right, inside the box, got that typical little card we get from Minis Forum. Now this was wrapped in plastic right here. And where do you get a load of this? Check this out. This thing 
I don't know what it weighs. It's got to be like four to six pounds. It is a brick. Let me bring it up close to the camera so you can see. Here's the front of it. This is our performance button here. So imagine when I try to turn it on and this button isn't turning it on, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> Where's the button? Well, it turns out the power button's up here. So yeah, you can push this all day long. It will not turn it on. <laughs> So this is obviously, as I've just learned, the performance mode button to switch your performance modes. You've got a cool spider web look here for the two cooling fans, one for the GPU, one for the CPU. And this side, it's gonna light up as you saw in the picture, and this is magnetic. This cover comes off. And with the right skills and printing equipment, you can make your own symbols and labels. And then this white pad, it's like a bright, this will be all green or all red, whatever colors, they don't have to be the same colors and they'll shine through on that. And then that just pops right on like so. Heavy, really heavy. All of our ports in the back, just as we showed online, we've got one of these uh, DIN power connectors, which is good because that means it's likely a plug that isn't going to fit into anything else. It looks like a barrel connector, but inside it's got several pins and it only goes in in the keyed direction only. We've got some rubber feet on the bottom. This is intended to sit upright. If you were to lay it flat, you'd be blocking this fan. And if you were to lay it flat this way, you'd be blocking the LEDs. So it doesn't really have an option for laying flat. Just so you're aware, it is intended to sit vertical. Now, if you were to sit it vertical, you might say, okay, it's heavy and it's solid. In fact, it would go this direction, right? Because this would be the front. It still seems like you can knock it over pretty easily with a little bump. Well, that's why here in the box, <laughs> this must weigh a pound. Wow. Maybe more than a pound, maybe like two pounds. We have a stand. You go, okay, well, where's the screws for the stand? How does that attach? Do you see any screw holes on this stand? Any holes in it at all? Um, that cutout right there, that's where the power cable is going to go through so it can plug in here. And then I think this is magnetic. Oh, it just grabbed it right out of my hand. Holy cow. <laughs> wow. See that again. That's a strong magnet. That ain't going nowhere. Impressed yet? We haven't even turned it on. All right, back over to the box. We've got this box here, which includes our power cable, a massive power brick. This thing is serious because we've got that graphics card that needs juice, and then an HDMI cable. That's it for your accessories. Pretty straightforward, nothing too complicated or complex. I don't see any owner's manual or instructions. Not that I would read them anyway, but I don't know if that's an oversight. Or if it's just so obvious. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Now, the reason why this magnet impresses me is this whole thing all together, I wish I had a scale. Between the weight of the stand and the weight of the unit, it's probably 10 pounds. If not, it's really close. I'm not used to mini PCs weighing that much, quite frankly. Now, with regards to this power adapter, let's bring that up and see what the wattage is. Now, normally I'd say, you know, if the, if the manufacturer's name's not on this power adapter, I would want to label it so that you don't confuse this with something else and accidentally plug it in and burn out whatever you plugged into. Uh, this just has the name of the adapter manufacturer. The mini PC manufacturers typically don't make the AC adapters. Now this AC adapter has, a, as I mentioned, a pretty unique uh, four pin DIN is what we would call that. So there's four pins inside. 
and then that little notch right on the edge, that's your key. So it only goes in one way. And that notch is visible on the other side where the dimple is. Right? Perfect camera. Yeah, that dimple is where the little key hole is, so you know which way this goes in. So less important to label this because it's likely not going to fit in anything else. Certainly couldn't hurt to label it. Now the wattage, that's what everybody wants to know. How many watts is this? You're looking at an output of 300 watts. 300 watts peak, right? That's just like the most you can draw under extraordinary heavy resource intense. It's a standard 19 volt, which is what a lot of mini PCs and laptops use, but that 300 watts makes it very different. That's also probably a good three or four pounds. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get a workout lift in this. All right, so let's do it this way. Let's plug this, where's the key? The key goes this way, this way. So the cable on the power is gonna face out the back, that makes sense. And then when this foot goes on, you'll align that slot. So that your power cable is not being sat on or crunched, right? A simple yet very thoughtful design. Now I'm going to grab my power cable. We're going to plug that in and HDMI. So we'll plug into our capture card. So as I mentioned, I've already gone through the out of box experience. I've already done the Windows updates. I've not run any testing on it. All I've done is try to reduce the number of time consuming things so we can get on with the uh, good stuff. Keyboard and mouse. I knew I was forgetting some. Keyboard and mouse. Luke Greenia says, that looks like the old S-Video connector. That power plug does kind of look like an S-Video connector, but that had a lot more than four pins in it. So here's our wireless dongle for our keyboard and mouse. I'll just throw that up here. And then when I turn this on, I hit this power button, and then you'll see this whole thing starts to light up. And then we'll switch over to our HDMI input and see what it's looking like booting. As soon as I find it. So I named the user Adam Man. Let's do a restart and see how long this takes to restart. So far, it's whisper quiet. I, I can hear a fan turning, but it's very, very quiet. And that assures me that it's on. Gary Tatum says that's probably a neodymium, a neodymium magnet. Yeah, I think it's a rare earth magnet. It's a strong magnet. They didn't go cheap on it, I'll tell you that. There's your boot time. Let me go full screen over here so I can see it the way you guys at home see it. And let's take a look at our device manager and see what we've got in here for graphics cards. All right, I'm gonna just right go to display. So yes, it looks like we have the one built into the CPU and the regular GPU. So the Radeon RX 7600M XT is a proper GPU. And the Radeon 610M, I believe that's the graphics built into the CPU. So that's what most mini gaming PCs, as they call them, would be using for their graphics. And you know, it's not terrible, it's not great. This on the other hand, should be super fantastic. You should be able to play all your AAA titles. In fact, let's do this. Let's bring up the browser. Ugh. 
Yeah. And the name, one more time. Got to remind myself what the name of that is. It's a Radeon RX. Got to walk up to the monitor to read it. RX 7600 MXT. So just without any testing, just looking at the specifications of the card, Radeon RX 7600 M. XT performance. I'm sure there are websites that have done testing. And we can see where this falls with regards to price versus performance. You want to spend more for a higher end graphics card. That option does exist to go external. And we'll talk more about that as well. well. I'm sure that's in here somewhere. Radeon, that at 7600M. So it falls close to the RTX, what's just above it? 4060, all right? 4060, that's, that's not bad. All right, and this size of a package for that price? Come on. Come on now. Now, yes, there's a 4070 and a 4080, 4090. And if you got that kind of money, um, you'd probably be better off with a desktop computer if you need that kind of performance. But you don't have to. You could still plug an external GPU on this, but I think it'd be kind of foolish personally because you could buy a much less expensive Mini PC, if that was your intention, was to plug in an external graphics card anyway. So why spend money on this graphics card if it's not, a, not good enough for you? We can always make something good enough for you as long as you're willing to pay what it costs, right? So if you want something that is tailored to a certain level of experience, then you will pay accordingly if you're that demanding. On the other hand, if your games or the way that you use your computer isn't that demanding, it certainly won't cost you as much. But nobody's giving away performance for free. And for, in, in fact, it doesn't really scale up economically. Typically, the more performance you get, it will cost you exponentially more in dollars compared to the percentage of performance you get back in return. So the higher the performance goes, the less the value. And uh, that's true of cars and homes and you know, fancier the home, or even if the home's on desirable property and it's a terrible home. So it, it all depends on how, what it's worth to you. And I have to say, I don't think there is a mini gaming PC on the market that beats this. So let me, let me close this out and let me grab my flash drive here with my utilities. First, what network adapters do we have? Let me just check. We have an Intel uh, 2.5 gig, and we've got a MediaTek Wi-Fi 7 card. Seeing a lot of these cards from MediaTek, I don't know if they have Linux drivers or not. But obviously, if you wanted Wi-Fi and you didn't have a driver for that on a different OS, you could just plug in a USB uh, Wi-Fi card if that's what you needed. I just don't know if MediaTek has Linux drivers. I, I don't use Linux and um, couldn't tell you. But let me plug my um, flash drive in here and let's grab my utilities off and do the standard testing we always do. Okay, so we're gonna grab, we'll put VLC on here like I always do. And we'll just install that straight off the flash drive. Well, that installs, we'll copy off Uncle Carrie's Windows 10 optimizer. Like so. And then under my PC testing software, we've got Crystal Disk Mark, so we can test the speed of the installed drive. Hardware Info, so we can monitor our temperatures when we run Crystal, oh, I'm sorry, not Crystal, uh, Cinebench R23, R23. And we can grab CPU-Z just, just in case. 
I think that's all we need off of this. And then I'll eject my flash drive. Let me first add that to the taskbar setting. I hate that it's hidden. On that one on. Okay, that's better. I just want them exposed. I don't want them hidden behind this arrow. That Microsoft OneDrive, that's what's hidden behind the arrow. I don't use it, so let it be hidden. The stuff I do use, I don't want hidden. Pretty simple logic there. Now, let me eject. Come on now, we're gonna eject. I know we've all dealt with this where it doesn't wanna let it go. Now, because we're not reading or writing to the flash drive, we can simply just pull it out. The other thing you can try is just right-clicking on the drive and choose Eject. And once the drive disconnects from here, you've, you're definitely now safe to pull the flash drive out. All right, so and that's been that way since Windows XP, maybe? I'm trying to remember when that first started. But it's not common knowledge. A lot of people don't know that. So let me grab my flash drive out of there, and then let's take a look. Ooh, sweating. Let's take a look at that performance button. I want to see how do we know what performance mode we're in. So if I, I look here on the front, we have a blue light and a green light. So I'm assuming one of these is power. I don't have my glasses on and I can't see the little detail. But let's hit this button. Now that light just went red. Didn't change these lights though, did it? I'm assuming red means performance. I don't know how well the camera's picking that up. Let me cut the lights for just a second so we can see this all better. Let's go this way. Oops. So below this, oh, I guess it's a green light. Cover that up. You should be able to see the red one. That flickering is not happening in real life. I don't know what the flickering is. But the camera, maybe the camera speed. So that's a green light and a red light. Now let me push the button. Now it's blue. Push the button again. Now it's red. So it looks like there's, from the best I can tell, two just two performance modes. Blue and red. Blue and red. And power is green. And then it doesn't seem to have any impact on this. This just seems to be randomly changing color. And as I mentioned, this is a magnetic cover. And you can see those two squares that I showed you earlier, how those work to light up whatever's the stencil on that cover. Okay. Okay. Now we can bring the lights back up. And let's go back over to our HDMI input and take a look at... First of all, what version of Windows did we get? Is it Home? Is it Pro? For a long time, Minisform was telling me they only install Windows 11 Home on all their mini PCs. And apparently that was a short-lived decision. I guess they got some feedback that uh, changed their minds. And so now some come with Home and some come with Pro. And nobody told me. So <laughs> I had made a video review and said, hey, just so you know, these are all going to be Windows 11 Home. And then I checked it, and it was Windows 11 Pro negating what I just said. But that's because nobody updated me. Uh, so be aware that it is not what I said. Although when I said it, <laughs> it was based on what I was told from an official at Minispar. Let's go right-click and go to System, and let's scroll down. And we have Windows 11 Home on this machine. But we do have another Minis Forum PC we're going to be bringing up here soon. And you'll notice that has Windows 11 Pro. So I think it depends on the purpose of the machine. If it's for home use or business use, I think a more business use computer would likely have Pro. And a more budget or gaming PC would have Windows 11 Home. And that makes sense. There's no benefit to you having Pro on this unless you need to connect to a domain server in an office. I mean, I understand Pro also has remote desktop and a BitLocker, but trust me, I've never run into a customer in my life that's ever used those. And there are third-party alternatives. Upgrading from Windows 11 or Windows 10 from Home to Pro is a complete waste of your time unless you're in a business environment. For a home user to do it, you might as well just take your money and flush it down the toilet. 
you will have the exact same result when you're done. Now, uh, don't, don't let me stop you. If you want to flush your money down the toilet, you are absolutely allowed to do that. I don't recommend it, but hey, it's your money. We're going to run Uncle Carrie's Windows 10 optimizer on this right quick, and then we'll run Crystal Dismark after a reboot, and then we'll run um, Cinebench R23 and see how the heat is controlled under those extreme circumstances. Now, I'm not a gamer. I, I am a gamer, but not what most people call gaming. You know, to me, a game was something you stood up to play. It had its own custom controller that you had to learn how to use. So a steering game would have a steering wheel. Um, Galaga had the, the, you know, it didn't matter if you were right or left-handed. That controller joystick was on the left. And the fire button was on the right. And you could not move or adjust their height, width, size, or even how stiff or loose the buttons were. You had to accommodate the game. You as a player had to have the skill. You could not bring your own controller and make your own adjustments to accommodate you. You played under the exact same conditions as everybody else. And I think that's way more fair and way more true of who's got talent and who doesn't. Didn't matter if you spent you know, a lot of money because you had it to buy some fancy equipment that made you better at the game. In fact, in most cases, fancy equipment doesn't make you better at anything. Better pots and pans won't make you a better cook. A better camera won't make you a better photographer. So it, to me, true gaming is arcade gaming. You stand up, you play at the machine using the machine's monitor, the machine settings. You don't worry about frames per second. You don't worry about uh, cherry or, <laughs> you know, what type of switches like cherry switches on the keyboard, you don't, none of that. That is all an indulgence of customization to the player that defines different parameters in which players are playing otherwise the same game. So if we're all not playing with the same tools, then we're all not playing by the same rules. And therefore, that is a game where if you just have more money and that gives you an advantage, it's just not fair to everybody else. So when it does come to gaming, the last big games I played were like Gears of War. Um, back in the day, I played a lot of Doom and Doom 2, even Wolfenstein, if you want to keep going back all the way to Zork, Android and Nim. These were thinking games, and these weren't games of any customization for the user. You played by all the same terms and conditions as everybody else. Android Nim, the keyboard was built into the computer. You couldn't change a keyboard out to be more comfortable. There was no mouse. There was no right-handed or left-handed anything. I don't know. I just think that's more pure and honest. So I am a gamer, but I don't, I'm not what these folks today call gamers. <laughs> And there's so many games to pick from, right? Whether it's an esports game or retro gaming, you know, maybe you want to emulate stuff on the PlayStation or NES. I don't know. Maybe you're into first person shooters. Maybe you're into uh, massively multiplayer uh, online role playing games. Maybe you're into, gosh, I mean, there's so many different genres and they all have different. Um, requirements some are more demanding than others whether we're talking about uh, what's the name of that chris roberts game uh, the starship citizen anyway some games have really high requirements at least to get the best experience and those you know really push for the industry to move forward at the same time they're very expensive uh, let's go to Crystal Dismark. Let's run this real quick while I keep while I keep yakking on about games. Now my father might say he's a gamer because he likes to play gin rummy. That's a game. It doesn't involve a computer necessarily. It involves a deck of cards. You don't have to worry about running out of power. You don't get to choose how big of a screen you have. You play with the same tools as everybody else you're playing cards with. Nobody has a special deck of cards that only they get and nobody else gets. That to me is the problem with gaming today. Like with an Xbox, you pretty much all use the same controller. And then it's just really up to you to decide how big of a screen you want to play on.
but at least the hardware is the same across the line. And the same with the PlayStation, or any console. At least then you're playing mostly by the same rules. And I realize you can buy other controllers, but for the most part, most people are likely just using the default controllers. And in doing so, you're leveling a playing field. And you're defining who really has skill and who has special equipment that redefines what their skill is that doesn't apply to anybody not using that equipment. Now, if the game isn't fair, that's not a game I want to play. But that's just me. That's just how, how, it, how I was raised. We always accommodated the game. If you were short and that controller was up a bit high, you had to learn how to use it or stand on something. You accommodated the game. Now games accommodate the end user, and because they can be customized, if I haven't made this clear enough, it means that the users quite often on PC gaming um, may be using entirely different equipment, keyboards, processors, graphics cards, settings, uh, even a faster internet connection. They could have advantages that, against the other players that has very little to do with actual skill and more with how much money they spent. And uh, if that's how you get through life, is, is making up for your lack of personal talent by spending more money, I'd like to know how the heck you got all that money. <laughs> because usually it's the talent that leads to the money. But uh, money will never buy you talent. All right. It could buy the illusion of talent, but it's not actual. I mean, if spending money was a talent, that's different. All right. Let's see. Charles Purdy wants to know, does this mini PC have USB 4? No, it does not appear to have USB 4. USB 3.2 Gen 2. Oh, you know, remember I was, I was Gen 2 by 2. Remember, I was always trying to find USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2. And that, that, that Gen 2 by 2 seems pretty rare to find. Although the flash drive makers, the external flash drive makers, were selling the heck out of these uh, super fast flash drives that very rare, very rarely did anybody have a computer that supported the 3.2 Gen 2 by 2. So there, there's so many different versions of USB and it's so confusing. But USB 3.2, there's a Gen 1 and a Gen 2. And then there's a Gen 2 times 2, which doubles the bandwidth. But only if you're plugging it into a 3.2 by 2 Gen 2 device. USB 4 is not compatible with the USB 3.2 by 2 uh, Gen 2. In other words, the performance increase that you get from USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 only works with another USB 3.2 Gen 2 by, by 2 device. That's the only way the by 2 works. It doesn't, there is no by 2 that's supported in USB 4, not currently. So, if you see a lot of those USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 external flash drives like SanDisk makes or Western Digital, if they're a really, really good price, that's probably because it won't run at the advertised speeds unless you have a USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 port, and most people don't. I don't even think this computer has it. And it's confusing, right? Because you're like, well, it says 3.2 Gen 2. Yeah, but it's missing the by 2 after that. So there's multiple versions of USB 3. USB 3.0, 3.1, 3.2 Gen 1, 3.2 Gen 2, 3.2 Gen 2 by 2. And then when you get to USB 4, there's no by 2 on that. So it'll still be compatible with USB 3.2 Gen 2, as far as speeds go. But that enhanced USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 is only available in that format and not on any other type of USB with backwards compatibility currently. So glad they made that clear, right? Now, we're looking at Gen 4 speeds right here with a 4,800 uh, megabytes per second. Megabytes, not megabits, on our read. Uh, just under 4,000 on our writes. That puts us right square dab in the middle of Gen 4 performance. Gen 4 runs anywhere from 3,700 up to 7,400. And then Gen 5 should run anywhere from about 7,500 to up to 14, 15,000. We're not yet at the 14, 15,000, but given another six or months or a year, 
and likely they'll start make you know the the chips haven't caught up with performance of the interface so we're in that gen 4 range let's close this out let's bring up uh hardware info and see what temps we're at right now just idling here there's only And we'll come down here to our temperatures. Okay, so this row here is our current temps. We're in the 40s. This is our minimum temp since we started the software, and then our maximum temp since we started this uh, HW info. If you just Google HW info, you'll find that it is available to download in free, and I always run the portable or zip additions, no installers necessary. Because I don't want to leave it on the system. I don't want to put files on there and registry, etc. Let's go to Cinebench. Let's test this cooling system out. Now Cinebench is going to run two separate tests, a multi-core that takes 10 minutes and a single core that takes 10 minutes and likes to heat up in the beginning. So right as we start this test, we should see our temps jump big time during this first minute and likely this will be the highest temp we will ever see on this computer under any circumstance and that's why i run the test i'm just curious how hot will this thing get we're seeing a, a total of 88.1 maximum on the ccd1 but what's interesting is on the ccd2 we haven't really broken uh 73, which is incredibly cool. We just barely broke 73. That's unbelievable. Oh, okay. Now, well, that, that went to 88 on the CCD1, but the CPU core temperatures still have only reached a maximum of 73.1. They're doing fantastic. And probably the CCD1 is going to be your performance cores, and the CCT2 is probably your efficiency cores or AMD's copycat of what Intel's done. That's what I think is happening here. And then over here on the upper left is our countdown. We can see how much time we've got left on the warm up. Once the warm up's finished, it'll run the benchmark and give us a score on our multi core. And then we'll repeat this on single core. So while I'm, well, we're both waiting for this. Let me take a look in the chat room. If you guys have any questions. Be sure and put them in the chat because I'm now looking at the chat. I'm sorry I haven't been looking at it before. So let me get caught up while we're waiting here.3D Everything just contributed a $20 super chat. He says, just because it was my birthday yesterday, I'm now 69 years on this planet and counting. Right on. Well, happy birthday, 3D Everything, and thank you for giving us the gift. You rock. 69, that's nothing. 96, different story. <laughs> you got a ways to go. I think you're fine. Happy birthday. David Graham said the video card is the XT version of the 7600M, which is actually way better than a 4060. It's closer to a TI, like a 4060 TI, or a 4070. Uh, thank you for the update, David. See, this is information I don't know because I don't, I don't do that kind of measurements. Um, for me, it's about work. It's about video rendering processes. And uh, 
I appreciate the information there. Eugene Eldago says, uh, thank you for such an informative, friendly, and honest show. Well, thank you, Eugene. Matthew Burden says, hello. Stealth Mode, Mark Baggett, Gary Tatum, all say hello. Mark Gaines joining us from Northern Ireland. Essential Working Too Hard, John Paul Bacon and Ron Barnish. Pete Tracker, 34, and Dean Simmersheim, all say hello. Dan Nilsson says hello. Patrick Ollie and Dave Batt, Charles Purdy. I see Gil Garcia and Darren Gilholm saying hello. Ray Gallagher. Easy Otter. Welcome in, everybody. Welcome in. PSC Computers Missouri with a $10 super chat. Thank you, PSC Computers Missouri. Shamim Kajvira says, this is exactly the mini PC that I wanted to be reviewed. You read my mind, Carrie. Well, either that or great minds think alike. Let's see if I can put myself on camera while we're looking at this re repeating uh, test here. Let's go to, let's see, I've got to go over here to this screen, click on this button. And then I've got to go over here and then drag this. Let's see, put it. I don't need to be that big. Here, drop it. Right there ought to be fine. Just so you can tell, I am here. All right. Jose Lopez with a $1 super chat right out. Thanks, Jose. John Paul Bacon says, uh, for AM5, the ASUS ProArt X670E Creator Wi-Fi, that is a massively huge motherboard. That motherboard is about three times the size of this whole computer. Anyway, he says it's got Wi-Fi 7. It has Gen 3.2 by 2. Type A, it has USB 3.0. Gen 3 by 2 by 2. Never heard of Gen 3.2 before. Oh, it's a Type C port and then two USB ports. Okay. And so that's just a motherboard that doesn't come with any case, power supply, CPU, RAM, storage, operating system, or cooler. How much is that motherboard? Out of curiosity, the ASUS ProArt. X670-E Creator Wi-Fi, I'll bet you cost nearly as much as this whole computer. This whole computer is $999 bare bones. And if you're just talking about a motherboard, and I mean a massively big, heavy motherboard, the dash E means it's extended. In other words, it's not a regular motherboard, it's an extended board. So if you think a regular motherboard is big, get one that says dash E on it, and it's even bigger. And then the more you add all of those components, the higher the price goes. So let's take a look at the ASUS ProArt X570E. Just out of curiosity, let me go over to Amazon because I'm genuinely, I'm curious. And that doesn't include the price of the CPU, the cooler, the case, the power supply, the RAM, the storage, the operating system, just the motherboard. ASUS ProArt, uh, let's go to Amazon first. Amazon, go back over here, Asus Pro X670, 670s last year, um, creator Wi-Fi. So I see a 790 with Wi-Fi 6E. 670E is not in stock. Asus ProArt. Well, it's much cheaper than I thought it would be. Let me uh, share the screen so you guys can see. Full disclosure, that's what I'm saying. So we're looking at last year right that's a 670 so that's last year's chipset 
I imagine when this was brand new, it had a higher price. So 355 just for the board. Now, to give that some perspective, you can buy a motherboard for 100 bucks. In fact, you can buy a motherboard that's pretty well decked out, like a Z-Series, for 150 So you're at twice the cost of, another mo of, a, of a standard motherboard to get all those bells, whistles, and features. And so by the time you propagate that with a chip, a cooler, RAM, storage case, power supply, uh, you're at least, at least going to be over the price of this mini PC anyway without the portability. So it's more expandable, but that's true of all desktops versus mini PCs. I'm not quite sure why this came up because it's really not a comparison. It's completely unrelated. But for the sake of argument, I am curious if they have an X, uh, a newer version of this board. Asus ProArt, let's just type that in as our search term this out go over here and we can oh, we're getting a bunch of monitors okay let's do motherboard this can be shocking so i hope you're sitting down here's the z790 at 440 dollars all right so this would be current with thunderbolt 4 but I'm curious if we sort this by price, if there is a higher priced version of this. For some reason, the Z690, this one right here, see all buying options, almost $700 for that motherboard. Anyway, you get what you pay for. I mean, if you need that, then you need it, you know? Or if you just have the money that's burning a hole in your pocket. But you're really not getting that much more from that $350 motherboard that you would from a hundred and, well, sub $200 motherboard anyway. The differences are very minor. But if they're important to you, you know, there's that. All right, what else is on your mind? The new AMD board probably isn't out yet. I don't think there will be a new AMD board. I think that uh, AMD's new processors are AM5 compatible, so they should work with any AM5 motherboard with a BIOS update. I don't think there's a new chipset that goes with it. I, I might be mistaken, but I think they're still using the same chipset. John, John says there are new chipsets. All right, well, that's news to me. You don't have to use those chipsets. You can use an AM5. You should be able to use any AM5 motherboard. But if you want to reap all of the benefits of the chip, then getting the chipset that's designed for it enables that. But if you just want to upgrade your chip on your AM5 now to a newer AM5, you will be able to do that on the 9000 series. It's just that you may not be able to get the full feature enhancement that the chip offers. I mean, it, it should be a step up, I suppose. I think the general consensus is if you already have an AM5 chip, don't bother upgrading to this one. But uh, if you're going to replace the motherboard and do a new build, different story. That's my understanding of it. I'm not too excited about it. I don't think I'm going to build one. I might change my mind, but with the move going on, I don't need another build. And it's not something I think is that innovative. It's just a, a small step forward with no real innovation. As far as I know, it's my understanding, and that's why I'm not too excited about it. All right, did our test finish? Looks like it finished. Let's go ahead and run. Uh, can't see the screen. Yeah, okay, so we got as our final score, and then let's run here. Once again, bring those temperatures up. We can monitor what's going on over here for our maximum recorded temperature throughout this test. Nothing really looks like it's changed. Gotten a little bit warmer on the cores, but still a far cry from any danger area. Far, far away. Lots of headroom there. That makes me happy. I like to see that. And these fans are quiet. 
But here's a question. Did I put this in performance mode? What, where did I leave it? I don't even, it's just now occurred to me. <laughs> There's a button on the front of this thing. I am not in performance mode. According to this, I'm in regular mode. So let me hit this button and see if, okay, let me, <laughs> let me do that. Let me stop this test and restart it under performance mode just to see what impact that potentially has on our temperatures. Because running a temperature test not in performance mode isn't exactly a, an accurate thing to do. So let's stop. Let's start it again from the beginning. Now we're in performance mode. And let's see if we get those temperatures higher because they seemed a little too low, and that would explain why. I also don't really hear the fans ramp ramping up. And as I mentioned, the first minute of this test is brutal, and it looks like... Nothing's changing yet. Everything looks pretty stable. So we'll keep an eye on it. And let me just check the front of this machine and make sure that light is red. I'm assuming red is performance mode. Unless I have it backwards. Either way, if our temps aren't any worse, regardless of which mode we had it in, then it means temperatures are under control regardless. Shamim has a question for me. And to answer your question, Shamim, I have sitting here sealed up in a box something that I think answers your question. This is the eGPU dock that connects via OkiLink. You put your own graphics card in it. it uh, I believe it has a power connector and it's a big plastic dock you put on the desk. There's nothing protecting your graphics card. There's no cover. It's just out in the open so it can have proper airflow. Pretty thin box. And this allows you to have your own external GPU of any make and model you want. No size or power restrictions that I'm aware of, but we'll find out when we uh, get to that. Luke Greenia says, Carrie, I'm sure you're probably tired of hearing it, but just to let you know, the Project Zero Build is an absolute amazing system, and thank you. I'm so happy it went to somebody who appreciates it and will take care of it. Each one of these builds I do, I put a lot of care. Each one has a little bit of me in it, so you might want to use some sterilizers. But it, it, it really is important to me that my work is appreciated. Otherwise, you know, it's, I'm not doing this for the money. I think everybody knows that. I, I do this because I enjoy it, and I enjoy spreading knowledge, and I enjoy uh, giving people something to consider so that I'm not making decisions for you. I'm not your butler. But that also you have the information, I hope, to make a sound decision that you won't regret later by providing you with what I believe is relevant information that most other channels don't discuss so you can pick what's right for you. And, um, you know, when I do these builds, a lot of times we're just doing the build for the channel and it doesn't have a home to go to. And once in a while, someone reaches out and says, you know, I really love that build you did. Could I buy it? And where we typically run into an issue is the cost of shipping. The shipping costs are outrageous. Shipping, Luke, the uh, Project Zero build cost nearly $200. So if you're taking into account the cost of all the parts, remove any cost of labor, remove any cost of operating system and cable management, that's all labor, take all that out. Take out the labor of packing the thing up, take out the labor of putting it into the car and driving it and waiting in line, filling out the forms, paying for it, getting the receipt, scanning the receipt, sending the copy of the receipt to the to the person so they have tracking information, making sure it gets there, that it arrives undamaged, that it powers up and works okay, and that the customer's happy. is all work I don't get paid for. And the customers go, gosh, you know, I could buy these parts myself with free shipping. I don't get free shipping. 
So whatever FedEx charges me is just shipping ground the cheapest way possible. I'm just asking for that back. I get nothing on labor and even the cost of the parts. I just ask for the cost of the parts back. If I break even and all I do is recover my investment financially, then all I've lost is all those hours of labor. That doesn't help me pay the electric bill at the end of the month, but if I know it's going to somebody who appreciates it and will take care of it and understands the value of it, sometimes I even sell it for less than what it cost me. I've spent $1,000 on a system I've sold for $500. But then when you add the cost of you know, shipping onto it, it's still a discount for the customer, but you're getting so close to the cost of just buying locally, it just doesn't make any sense to have me ship it. I know if I was located in Florida, I'd probably sell all of these locally, but I don't get many local buyers over the internet. And as such, um, I end up having a little bit of an overflow of PCs here. And I do try to find a local person to sell, to, to buy them from me, but I don't, I just don't want it to go to anybody. Not if it's a nice, if it's a special build, you know, like I think Project Zero was, then I want it to go to a special person. Otherwise, I might as well put it on a shelf as a showpiece. <clears throat> because it will cost me money. All right, so let me take a look at our, did we get our final? Uh... Okay. <coughs> We're still testing. We've got about four minutes left. Our max temp hasn't really changed. Everything looks good. No surprises. And back over to the chat. Let's see what else is going on here. And thank you for the update, Luke. I'm glad you're enjoying it. John Paul Bacon said, if fast access with USB ports, the ASUS Pro Out motherboards are what you want, if it be AMD or Intel. There's other options out there besides ASUS, but, you know, it depends on, again, what it's worth to you. How many ports do you need? How many will you be using simultaneously and at what speed? You can have the fastest ports in the world, but if your USB drives aren't that fast, you're just wasting money and fooling yourself. But I imagine anybody buying at that level understands what they're buying and doesn't need my explanation. But that is definitely a niche product. I would imagine that of all the motherboards ASUS sells, the Creator line is probably the least selling of all of them, partly because of how expensive they are and partly because of how big and heavy they are. They require a bigger case. Um, and most end users wouldn't spend that money for something they don't need. So it is a niche product for a niche audience. And it is available if you consider yourself in that niche, but then if you're in that niche, you probably already know that. So that's why I don't know why it's so much worth talking about. I don't think it's an equivalent comparison to what we're looking at today with the Atom map. Um, this is far more affordable and far, far more usable to more people would find this appealing in the buyer's market than a niche motherboard. Oh, that's nice and cold. Man, it's hot. Have I mentioned how hot it is? It's hot. We have the uh, MSI Meg, for example. And the MSI Meg is a, is a wonderful line of motherboards. Then again, you're going to get your fast ports and all that stuff but they're profoundly expensive and, and, and it's a niche product. Uh, if you're building workstations for businesses, that'd be a different story. That may be more of the norm, but for the general public, yeah, very niche. Now, uh, as soon as this test completes, I'm wondering how you get this thing open to upgrade it. Because I don't have any documentation, I'm not exactly sure how you get at it. I guess we're going to find out here shortly. And while we're waiting, I could probably get my overhead camera plugged in because I'm sure its battery is dead. Despite being turned off this whole time, these Sony cameras, they just drain the batteries when they're off. 
which is something that used to happen with uh, like nickel hydride batteries and stuff. These lithium batteries should not be draining like that. What can you do? It is what it is. So let me grab a power cable. And in this case, it's powered by USB. And then we have an HDMI cable for the video output. I just don't want the battery to die on me because likely it's only got minutes of life left in the batteries. It was not prepared before the show. I didn't even think about it till now. Better late than never, I suppose. And then we can swing that. Um, you know what? I can turn it on since I'm running off USB power. We'll just turn it on now. There it goes. It's up right here. It's over here. Um, do this. This is going to need to come around. So I got to get this cable out of the shot. You get to see all the background stuff that's done on edited videos. And it can make an, edit, an edited video take a week to film to get it all right. By doing this live, we just leave all this in so you can see how the magic's done. And uh, as though you were here with us filming rather than trying to make a commercial, because that's I don't want to make commercials. If I haven't been clear about that, like to be real, genuine, authentic, and show everything as it happens and how we react to it as professionals. Now, uh, looking at our tests, we should just about be done with that. Let's take a quick look under the full screen over here for me. Okay, we're almost done. It looks like the benchmark is going to be running or is running now. And like I say, all that stuff was warming it up. And then the benchmark happens after the warm up. And we're looking at really no difference in our temps. Everything's very, very civil. And I do hear the fans a bit more now, but they're not loud. I mean, you definitely know it's on, but it's, it's pretty much a, a whisper a very very quiet white noise but it's definitely there yeah i'm curious which side i want to open this from i'm gonna guess if the heat sinks are over on the right side my right then probably that's the back side of the board with the cpu that we don't want to touch <laughs> Likely, my guess would be we want to be on, the, on the, the side where the lights are. Probably have to take those lights out. And then behind those lights, I'm hoping we have uh, no further obstacles to getting to the RAM storage. But we'll find out here live. As soon as this is done, we have our final number. Gregory Howard contributes $20 in Super Chat. He says, I'm enjoying my new PC that you built. She's green right now. Here's my late fee. <laughs> Hello to Carrie, Mara, and all in chat. Right on. Thank you, Gregory. Glad to hear that. Gregory got that little coffee maker PC we built. Pretty specialized little unit. Part of me didn't want to sell it, but I've got so many computers. If I don't start selling them, um, you won't even be able to see me anymore. I'll just be <laughs> somewhere in behind a, a wall of PCs. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it. Okay, almost done with the test. We're almost done. There's our final numbers. And uh, there's our scores. And then there's our maximum temperatures here on the right side. And we can scroll down and see other maximums regarding uh, voltages and performance, right? 5.4 gig. Wow. Um, I scroll through this, not so much that you can keep up to read it, but that you can freeze the frame uh, after the video or even now during the video. 
you can freeze frame that screen to read any details. Some people could care less and some people really, really like the granular detail. So I just put that up there and then they can freeze frame it. The rest of you can be like me and say, you know what, who cares? At least for these kind of tests, this isn't, the rest of this information isn't really something I'm interested in. But for viewers who are, they can freeze the frame and read that. Now let's close this, close this, close this, and shut this down. Whoops, I hit sleep by mistake. I need to disable. Okay, uh, let's wake it back up. Now let's shut it down. And let's go to this camera right here, which will be the close-up camera. Yeah, I want to say that works. And let's get rid of camera one for right now. And let me find a way to adjust this. Move my keyboard and mouse here. Um, well, I want to do this. I guess let's just unplug everything. That's a good place to start, including this power brick. So let's lift this up off of its base. Unplug it. Let's get all that out of the shot. Set this down. If I work on it here, that means the camera has to go at least right there. If I lift this out, we do see some screws. So let me grab my screwdrivers. Uh, you're going to need some jeweler's screwdrivers or, or really small, detailed screwdrivers. Those are super tiny. I wonder if my regular um, JAS driver will work. Those look very similar to the M.2 screws. No, it's just too small. All right, yeah, we're going to have to use the, the, the jeweler's drivers. I wonder if I can get away with this big one. It gives me more leverage. No. Wow. All right, then. How about now? Yes. That one fits. This is a. If the camera will focus. What a struggle. I got to figure out where the camera's focus point is. Around here somewhere. All right. Anyway, so the driver has a size on it, which I can barely read. I guess it's this side here. It says that this is a number zero Phillips. Just so you know. All right, let's see what's under here. One. What's over here? Two. Now, I have no idea how this opens. I'm just making this up as I go, just as I would as a service field, a field service technician. If customer were to call me out, I never know quite what equipment I'm working on. Whatever the customer has, then I have to accommodate the customer. I have to accommodate the equipment. I don't have a lot of time to do any research. I have the, the, you know, the clock is ticking. And the more people I can help, uh, the more money I can make and the faster. Oh, I see what I've done here. These two screws right here, looks like they hold the light in because we have two more for each. So four screws for each light. But, I also see screws here at the edge. And I'm thinking maybe it's these screws, not these. Yeah, I don't know. Let, let's see what happens here. Now these screws are actually a, a, like a number one Phillips. This number zero just slides inside the head and I'm afraid of stripping it.
that's a much bigger screw. Let's take that one out. I kind of feel like maybe this is the way I should have gone. For take this one out. Now what? There's a lip right here. See that indentation right there? So that implies to me that that comes off. Something else is holding it in. Hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking these screws need to stay in. Let me put these back because I got a feeling could be wrong, but I've got a feeling those just hold the LEDs in. And if I'm wrong, I'll take them back out, but I don't want to confuse myself with a bunch of screws. Now, what's interesting is where the screws are that we removed here and here do not have an equivalent here and here. They have these little slots but those slots are there for this lid, so it slots into one side. Actually, the slots are here too. Just outside of the slot is where the screw is, and over here we don't have one. So I'm wondering if this just doesn't come up and pull out. I don't know. Let's play. I mean, I still may have to take those out. I don't know yet. I'm not convinced that this isn't just screwing into this one bigger piece. And if so, what's holding this piece in? You can see it starts to separate. And sting. I don't want to break it. Oh, okay. What you've got to keep in mind is there are going to be power connectors here, and you don't want to rip them out like I just did. So, luckily, there appears to be no damage. The connectors are still on. Sometimes when these pull off, they take the board connector right off with them and then you damage the board. So here I am trying to figure this out and you do have to be very gentle because even sometimes if you don't, like in this case, these just light up the LEDs. But if this were, you know, had antennas for the Wi-Fi, those wires are far more fragile than these or these are fragile at the ends. So you definitely want to pull these out by hand very gently, uh, not just let the, what happened was the weight of this unit as I was pulling it up, um, it kind of fell, and then the weight of inertia pulled these right out, both of them. I'm not even sure where they plug in, but I do see one fan header right there. And I believe this one or this one. Probably that one is my guess. In the meantime, we can get a good look inside of this bad boy which wasn't too terrible to open once you know how. I just wasn't confident. <laughs> now you can watch my video and you can be confident on what to expect. There's our two sockets for RAM. We have our Wi-Fi card here, which is removable and upgradable to another Wi-Fi if you should choose to do that. This giant heatsink is for the NVMe drives. That's pretty impressive. This fan is likely cooling either the GPU or the CPU. But remember, we have two, I want you to count these, right? We have a fan here. That's gonna be blowing air out right here. Not sure what's under it, but probably the CPU or GPU. We have a CMOS battery, this fan. So one fan, two fan, turn it around this way. Three fans, four fans. 
And this looks like it comes up as well. I see this has a lip on it is right, right there. There's a lip on it. I don't know what screws would have to release that or if it just pops out. Nor would I know why you'd want to pop that out because all you're going to see is the, the, the two fans and heat pipes. That's all that should be under there. Yeah, I don't know. And like I said, there's really nothing, nothing user accessible under this, so I don't even know why you'd want to take that off. Okay, so if we wanted to add or change out the RAM, we have easy access to it right here. And if you're curious what brand and speed type, put that there and see if this will focus. Come on, cooperate. Maybe I got to zoom it in. Hold it here. Might have to get a different overhead camera. This one is very finicky. <laughs> it just refuses. There it goes. There it goes. So we are looking, because I can't read it. My, my glasses, even with my glasses on, that font is still too small for me to read. But I do have a more powerful pair of glasses. I just don't like to wear them. It looks like this is Kingston and we have a part number. Hmm. It doesn't tell us how much RAM is on here or that it's DDR4 or 5. Usually it says it right on the label. I'm going to guess it's 16 gigs each of DDR5, what I think is in there. So underneath this heatsink is our M.2 drive. You can see the little M.2 drive sticking out right there. And that's either in the Gen 4 slot or the Gen 5 slot. We'd have to remove, let's see. I don't know that this screw has to come out. It looks like that one and that one. Maybe this one and this one too. Let's take out that one first. That one is right on an edge there. That's a little difficult to get to. And I just dropped the screw. These, these little drivers I'm using are not as magnetized as, uh, as my main driver. So let me just grab that. Let's see if I can grab the screw magnetically. Got it. Now, Notice this power cable right here. When you take this off, you want to take it off this way, or you want to unplug it, or just simply move it out of the track so that we don't pull that cable out. Now, just taking those two screws out does not seem to have loosened. So these other two must have to come out, unfortunately. So we've got one here. And we've got one here. And I believe that's all four. Be mindful of this power cable. Yep, we're sliding around there on this, the uh, thermal tape. There it goes. Oh, this is our other M.2 going this way. And this M.2 going this way. Interesting. And we already have thermal tape in both positions which is weird that they didn't cover up the thermal tape for the unused area, but it is what it is. There's our Kingston PCIe Gen 4 drive. What about Gen 5? So my question is, is this a Gen 5 slot or is this the Gen 5 slot? 
How do you know? I mean, there's probably some documentation somewhere. But you know me. I'm not a big fan of documentation. Let's grab a Gen 5 NVMe and put it in this slot and then run a test and see what it does. That's one way to tell, right? If you remember from the other day, I had that spare Gen 5 drive, brand new in a box. Let's grab it. Let's put it to some use. I don't know that I'll keep it in here, but maybe I will. So you can see what I'm doing. Let's switch over temporarily to camera one, and we'll come back to... Uh, We'll come back to the close-up camera here in a minute. Okay. So these are my, my stronger glasses, and anything within a few inches is magnified, and everything else is distorted. So I don't like wearing them. They're very um, disorienting in anything other than close-up work. Now this is a crucial T700. I'll bring this up to the camera and not have to fight with the focus on the top-down camera. We'll just bring it right up to you this way because this camera focus is better. That's brand new in the box. It's a two terabyte Gen 5 drive. And we should hit 12,400 megabytes per second on a sequential read if that's a proper Gen 5 port. I don't know which one is Gen 5 and which one is Gen 4, but I do know that you, know, you can read documentation all day or you can just plug it in and see with your own eyes and have a personal experience. So I'm choosing to have the personal experience. Let me go back to uh, where my chat room go. Here's my chat room. It says website says Gen 4 for the M.2. I thought it said one was Gen 4 and one was Gen 5, but maybe I misread it. Let's take another look. Let's go back over to my capture, window capture. And we'll scroll down to where we get to the M.2 ports here. Now, do you see this right here? It says M.2 PCIe 4.0. This one says M.2 PCIe 5.0. But there's some text here I can't read. Let me get a little closer. Supports RAID 0 and RAID 1. Wow. Oh, I didn't realize. I guess that makes sense, though. But why does it show PCIe 5 on one drive? See, that, that suggests to me, by looking at that photo, that one port is Gen 4 and one port is Gen 5. Usually, motherboards that support Gen 5 only support it on one port. It's pretty rare to find a motherboard that supports it on two, although Minis Forum does make one. So am I missing something? David Graham says, I bet they populated the Gen 5. Yeah, they might have. I don't know. But it's easy enough to check. We don't have to put the, the lid back on. Well, we test it because the lid's only for LEDs. It's not for cooling. So let me go back over to camera one. And instead of trying to interpret the directions, which is what, this is why I don't read directions. Let's just see for ourselves what it truly is. I know I have a Gen 5 drive. So if I'm not getting Gen 5 speeds, it's not because I confused the drive, okay? So let's just start. Let's just start by taking... That is the biggest M.2 screw I've ever seen. Okay, <laughs> let me switch back over to the close-up camera here. Yeah, that is a long M.2 screw. But let's just start with the empty slot first. Kind of wiggle and push. And that's literally all we have to do. Not a big deal. We can fire it up. We can initialize this tribe and run very quickly Crystal Disk Mark on it. So with that, um, obviously I wanna, at the very least, we just wanna set this back down, which would go this way. We don't have to screw it in place, not yet. We'll do that when we're done. And yeah, let's just see what happens. Like I said, we can, we can leave, um, 
We can leave the LED lid. We can leave all that off. Magnetize itself right back. That cleans up the area, doesn't it? All right, so I'm going to put power. HDMI. I guess we really don't need the network. I've left the uh, keyboard plugged in, so we'll hit the power button. I'll show you a top down on this when we hit the power button just for fun. Wrong screen, Carrie. There it is. Power button's right there. See the fans come alive. We'll go to our HDMI input. This is why it's so important to have so many inputs on my capture card. Look at how much I'm switching back and forth. Okay, now we'll run Crystal. Uh, no, not yet. I got to format the drive. Partition and format our new drive. So we'll just type in disk management. There it is. Create and format. It should auto detect a new drive. There it is. And all we have to do is hit OK. Now it's a big partition. Right click, new volume. Next, 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 finish. Formatting that volume now. Brand new, out of the box, never been used. Gen 5 but it will only run at whatever speed it's plugged into. So if we plug it into a Gen 3 motherboard or a Gen 3 M.2 slot, it will only run at Gen 3 speeds. Same with Gen 4, all the way up to Gen 5. But we'll take a moment. That's normal. It appears that I did lose my local connection on my secondary internet here. So if Mara got disconnected, I am aware. Mara says the storage expansion is listed as Gen 4, though I'm not quite sure why they show a Gen 5 drive. So we're just going to confirm that just because we can. In theory, if, uh, if the information is being interpreted correctly, these are both Gen 4. But there's one way to know for sure, and this is it right here. So we're going to go to the D drive. That's our new one. And we're just going to do the sequential read and write, nothing more. And if we only get up to 7,400, then that means we're Gen 4. That easy to know for sure. As you can see, at 12,384, that is Gen 5. That is absolutely a Gen 5. That's incredible. Imagine if both, if both of these slots supported Gen 5 and you put this in a RAID 0, you'd get 24,000 megabytes on sequential read, which is insane. It's absolutely insane. Let's see what the rights are on it. Eleven thousand. Wow. Holy moly. That's super fantastic. Super fantastic. And, you know, the fans aren't running overly loud or anything. They're just, just running there. Everything looks happy. Wow. You think I'm impressed? Because you'd be right. That's impressive. So how many of you were wrong thinking that was all going to be Gen 4? This is why I don't like instructions. I want to see what it is in reality. I don't want to interpret what somebody wrote or rely on and assume that what they wrote is factual. So there you go. Now I imagine if I move that M.2 to the other position, if I trade places, I'll bet you the other one's Gen 4. You know how to know for sure? We're gonna do it. So first thing is we wanna shut down. Those are fantastic numbers, by the way. Fantastic, very happy with that. Let's go to, uh, let's see, I have to see that bigger. Close this, shut this down. 
And then we'll go back over to camera one. And let me look in the chat room and see what people are saying here. Mara says she got disconnected and storage is listed as Gen 5. On both ports or just one? I don't know. Let's find out. First, we want to disconnect power. So let me switch again. Let's switch over to... Going a little mouse crazy today. Okay. Now, because I left the screws off of this, I should be able to just take that right off. And we're going to swap these two drives. The Kingston is our default boot drive, and it looks like that one screw is also, this is very unusual, but it appears to be holding down our Wi-Fi card. I stacked it. See that? That's quite unusual. Okay, internet connection is back up. Mara should be able to get reconnected again. Now, when they do this, it, it's really important that you're not lazy and try and push this out because you're going to pull these wires off for your Wi-Fi. But just go ahead and take the Wi-Fi out first because it's on top. Clear those wires and you're going to save yourself a lot of work by taking, taking your time now. We're going to just set that. That was in that position right there. So I don't forget. I don't want to forget which one was where. And then we're going to take this crucial drive. And we're going to move it to this position over here so I don't get them confused. We lay this drive down first, being very gentle with our Wi-Fi card here. Unless you like to mess with those wires, I don't. So I'm going to keep the wires on. Then this goes on top, and it's going to go into its slot here. Until all those gold fingers are in the slot. And then that screw is going to go right back in. Yeah, that's quite unusual. And then our main boot drive should still be the main boot drive. It shouldn't matter which slot it's in. The BIOS should automatically know there's nothing on this one but a format and move to the next one. And I don't know what order it's going to check them in. If they were both bootable, you could, in theory, put one operating system on one, another operating system on another, and go in your BIOS boot settings and decide which one you want to boot from instead of using a boot menu. All right, and now we can just lay this back on top. went twisted around I think I've got this backwards from where I had it it obviously can't go on that way it has to go on that yeah, this is facing me the opposite way. I was used to that cable coming towards me. I'm just going to, once again, just set it on there just so we do have some cooling. I don't want to pinch that cable. Close enough for government work. And there's a power button here somewhere. There it is. And we'll go back over to our HDMI input. Again, it should auto-detect that we moved the drive. And boot just the same. All right, let me go full screen over here. 
Now, with our Gen 5 drive in the other slot, we're going to determine if the other slot we moved it to is Gen 5 or Gen 4, just simply based on the speeds we're going to get. Again, if we're in the 7,000 range, we're running Gen 4. And if we see that 12,000 or any, anything over 7,400, we are going to be in Gen 5. Now, if we are in Gen 5, imagine two of those at a RAID 0. All right, so it's still going to be the D drive, right? It's a 0% full. It's an empty drive, in other words. We're using 0% of it is completely empty. So even though we moved its position, its drive letter did not change. However, its performance might. We're about to find out. We don't have to worry about anybody says. We can prove without a doubt what the truth is. It's Gen 5. Holy moly, that's Gen 5. Okay, do I have another one of these crucial T7s? Or do I just have one? Oh, I'm getting excited now. Uh, I'm getting excited. Getting excited. Oh, what do I have? What do I have? Oh, oh. Oh, okay, so the crucial drive, I think I only have one of those. Well, I had others. I just don't know where they are right now. Gen 5. Oh, Gen 5. There's something else I have. I have a real strange manufacturer's name, and I bought two of them. Where did I? Oh, they're right here in front of my face. Okay. Ah, wait. Those are Gen 4. Never mind. Okay, so I do have two Gen 5 drives. They're ones I've never used or evaluated before. They're two terabytes each. Look at those numbers. Are you kidding me right now? Okay, so check this out. Let's close this. Let's shut this down. If I can be on the right keyboard, that would be great. Let's go back to our close-up camera. I have these brand new in a package. I've never used them. I believe these are Gen 5. Yeah. It says here, PCIe Gen 5 by 4. So we could set two of these up into a RAID 0. Ooh. Oh, this gives me ideas. This gives me ideas. That's a dangerous thing. That's why we didn't screw that back down. All right. <laughs> oh, now the mad scientist can work. We're going to take out our bootable drive here. We can clone this with a Cronus. Oh, thank goodness for a Cronus. Look at how that just tied in. You see why I use their product? Because this is going to make my life so much easier. Okay, I don't want to mix this up with other Kingston drives. I got, I got a lot of spare ones here. I don't want to mix them up. So keep it right there. Go over here to camera one. Oh, I'm super excited. Now, look, these are all unrehearsed. I, I'm figuring out things just like I do for customers when I go out on the field. And, you know, a customer calls and says, I need this fixed, and I have to go out there and fix it, regardless of what it is. It could have been built by their cousin, for all I know. It could have six graphics cards in it, and somehow it still boots. I have seen it all, and I can fix it all. But sometimes it just takes a minute to orient myself to figure out unfamiliar hardware. But I will always, I will always figure it out. There's nothing in the computer world that I cannot fix. It's just how much do you want to spend. And sometimes it's just cheaper to replace hardware. But it's not because we can't fix it. It's because it doesn't make financial sense to invest in it. But that's up to each owner to decide. I had a customer bring me an old machine that I didn't recommend fixing. I said, you know, for, for how old it is and the amount of trouble it's going to be to get it to me, to drive across town, to have me fix it, and then you drive all the way back across town. And if there's any problems, I'm going to be very limited with how I can help you. He says, I don't care. 
I said, but you could just go to Best Buy and you could buy a brand new computer. This one is already 10 years old. It's giving you your money back. Or it was at least eight years old. Do you really want to spend that much time and effort in fixing it? And he said, yes. Okay. I'm just saying, if you went to Best Buy or went on Amazon or something, you could order a brand new machine. You could have it today with a brand new warranty that's all upgraded already. Nope. I understand that. I want you to fix it. Great. Bring it over. So I do try to talk my customers out of it. I am a terrible businessman. I wouldn't put money in that. But if you want me to. How many techs or any business that sells a service would talk their customer out? It's very, very, in my world, very unusual. If anything, they try and sell the customer more of what they don't need. All right, here's our first look. I'll just bring this up to the front camera here because, again, of the focusing issues. Here's a, a first look at the Team Group Z540. I've had really good luck with Team Group. I did have that one drive fail in the QNAP NAS. And I didn't even have to talk to anybody. I went online. They gave me an RMA number. I shipped it in. They shipped me a brand new replacement. Never spoke to a human being. I'm, I'm happy with that. Let me go to the close-up again. Put that one there. Now, here's the thing. Some of you might be thinking... Why not boot it now and clone this drive to this drive? Well, because when I take this drive out, we're not going to have a CND. We're going to set this two drives up as a RAID 0, so they need to be completely reformatted so that 50% of the data will be on one drive, 50% will be on the other, and it will read from both simultaneously. Now, that means backups are important with a RAID 0. It means if either drive fails, you lose everything, and your chance of a failure is now doubled. All right, so keep all that in mind. RAID 0 does come with consequences, but nothing but external backup won't help you resolve. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And you will lose everything the same as if you only had one drive. You're tricking the computer, essentially, with RAID 0 to tell it that these two drives are one big, fast drive and to read from both of them at the same time. So if this can read at 12,000, and the one we put in here can read at 12,000, we should be well over 20,000 megabytes per second on our reads, with the risk that, you know, we could potentially lose everything without a backup. Now, RAID 1 would mirror one drive over to the other, so you would never see the second drive. You'd lose whatever storage. So if this is 2 terabytes, and if this is 2 terabytes, and it's in a RAID 1, it automatically backs up everything from one to the other as it's happening, including viruses, temp files, everything. But that's still not a backup because if somebody steals this machine or this machine doesn't boot, your power adapter dies, you've got no access to your data. So RAID is not backup. RAID is data redundancy, or in the case of RAID 0, it's called striping. If you can picture the data... Zero one one zero 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 one one zero zero one zero one zero one. Instead of zero zero one one zero 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 zero, just all going on one drive, it splits it in half and takes every other byte and switches it to the drive back and forth. So they call that striping. I bought these for an entirely different purpose. This is what happens in my world. You know, things, uh, things change rapidly. What's this? Oh, we, it's thermal tape? Or is it just a sticker? Maybe you got to put the sticker on and make it go faster. It looks like thermal tape on one side, but not on the other. Oh, you know what this is? This is a heat sink. This is a really thin heat sink if you don't have a proper... This ain't going to cut it for Gen 5, by the way. Uh, Gen 5 will get very, very hot. But this heat sink, this should handle. Uh, this, this heat sink here should handle. Oh. 
we'll know if our numbers start dipping down randomly. Like if we start running the read test and we get 20,000, but on the right test, we get like 3,000. That's because the drives are throttling down because of their, their overheating. So hopefully we won't experience that phenomenon if the cooling is adequate. I see, that's the, that's the sticker right there. So now we put this one here. It's got to go. Got to go that way with the Fizon controller facing up. This wires out of our way very carefully. Make sure we reseat our Wi-Fi card into its slot. This is a little plastic cover that is protecting us from popping those wires off by mistake. That in its slot. Whoops, we'll just take the plastic cover off. How about that? Put that in its slot. We're going to push down on the M.2 first. Then the Wi-Fi card second. Secure. It's lined up properly. It's not lined up here. And I just dropped the screw because the screwdriver is not magnetic. So let me grab my magnetized driver. Oh, you know what? It's right here on the desk. Uh oh. I accidentally turned the machine on. I should I should have pulled power from it so that wouldn't have happened. We should be okay though. Here's the screw. All right, let's try this one more time. really bugs me this driver is not magnetized and this little plastic cover just clips right over those wires and it kind of holds on to both drives just clips on there that's done now Should be able to set this back down. Go. Something like this, I think. Again, I've got that little white wire getting caught up in everything. And I'm not worried so much about the wire. I am a little bit, but I'm worried about this thermal paste or thermal pad. Uh, not being lifted up and sitting on the drive because it's sitting on the wire and it slightly tilts it up. Now, I'm not going to screw this down because we're not going to run that much of a test on it. However, the problem we've got now is we have two drives in here that have no format, no partition. They're brand new out of the box. And to set up a RAID 0, we typically have to go into the BIOS. So let's turn this on and figure out how to do that in the BIOS. And we've never seen the BIOS on this anyway. And today we're going to run a little long because just this feature could be a whole show on its own. Now, because it has nothing to boot from, it automatically brings up the BIOS screen. And we're going to go over here. We can still use the mouse. This is a graphical interface. And we'll go to Setup. Now here we've got a BIOS version of 1.0, and we can check Minisform's support side to see if there's an updated BIOS. But let's go to Advanced. Where would that be? Onboard devices, maybe? Resize bar, CIE ports. 
should not be under main. It's not going to be under security. It should be under advanced. Network stack hardware monitor onboard devices. Was that where I was? Never mind. Trusted computing, no. CPU, no. ACPI, no. Network stack, no. CBS, what is CBS? PBS. Graphics. I don't see anything for storage. It wasn't under onboard devices. Storage. Nothing. Boot. What's under boot? Boot option one. These are just boot options. Driver option property. It's got to be under advanced somewhere. Isn't that weird? I don't see anything about storage. What am I missing? The ACPI is like your power, like sleep mode and stuff. That's interesting. A lot of controls here regarding the different fans on the system and their current performance. Um, yeah, okay. It's all about PC health, so that's not what I'm interested in. That was under the hardware monitor. This is the ACPI setting, so again, nothing we want here. Should not be under networking. Yet normally, you would see an option here for RAID. I wonder if it's not been implemented yet. We, you know, we do have an early prototype of this, an early release. Or it's somewhere that I'm just not seeing it. This is our RAM, speed of RAM, date and time, processors idling at 2.5. You know, I'm always a little worried about 1.0, right? Previous values, defaults, back, exit. I would think onboard devices. SSD1. Enabled or disabled. Wireless LAN enabled or disabled. GLAN. I don't know what GLAN is. Maybe that's just the regular LAN. We can just turn it on and off. There's no option in here for RAID. What the heck? Hmm. Without setting the RAID in the BIOS, there's no way to do it in Windows unless we had a third drive. So if we had a third uh, storage drive, we could boot off the third drive and then take the other two and use a software RAID within Windows. But if we want the system to boot, then it has to see both drives as one, and that's done in the BIOS. So I'm wondering if that's missing for some reason. Because I don't see, like we have boot options here, which there's nothing to boot from. The BBS menu, nothing to boot from. The UEFI shell, if we wanted to open like a command prompt. The boot tells it to restart and set up. I mean, I don't see anywhere else it would be. What am I missing? So for me personally, I would expect an option here on its own, or it would be under onboard devices. And every time I go in here, <laughs> it's the same as the last time I looked. I don't know why I keep going in. 
I just feel like it's there and I'm not seeing it for some reason. It's definitely not going to be under hardware monitor. It's definitely not a network thing. And I'm not sure what this, what was this about? SMU options. Oh, so that's our TJ Maxx, et cetera. Let's go back. System configuration. Oh, we can, we can bump up the wattage here. I see. Okay. I'm not interested in that. Whoops. Let's go back. Audio graphics. It's like power related stuff. That was SMU. CPU common options, which obviously has nothing to do with storage. Let's go back again. EBS. It says graphics config. I don't want that. I am looking for storage. And um, yeah, I don't see anything. This would be your TPM and stuff like that, your TPM 2.0. Well, there is one other thing I can try. Let's, uh, let's go back to camera one. And let's do a couple of things. First, I'm going to shut this off. I mean, there's no worry of any, of letting it run. It's just, it's not going to do anything until we have it properly configured. But what I want to do is do a quick search on the, um, on, on, on Google, just to see if anybody has gotten raid and how to do it. So Minis Forum does have a Discord server. I'm looking to see if there's a driver support page. You know, if the product's not released yet, that support page may not be up yet. On the other hand, it might be there. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so there's a support page for the other Adaman, the X7Ti, not for the, uh, this is G7PT. And the X7Ti is running Intel Arc graphics instead of uh, AMD. So even if it had a BIOS update, it wouldn't apply to us. And it does show BIOS version 1.0 on that as well. So, hmm. I can share this screen with you here. So I'm looking at a support page here from Minis Forum. There's our link. We have drivers and tools, BIOS, user manual. But nothing for the Atom Man that we have here. Yeah, I keep remember, keep forgetting. Is it G7 PT, P7 GT, something like that? But this is the X7 Ti, which is a different Atom Man. It looks like that with the touchscreen on the front. And if we go back, you can see on the again the support page. We do not have. This is such a new product. It's not shipping till the end of next month. 
even if we go to others, it's probably not going to be in there. So like here's the Nook X i7. So you would select that, let's say, then you can go to downloads, BIOS, drivers. That's how you would locate that stuff. So what I've been trying to do is do a search to see if anybody's, you know, got any links. Otherwise, um, it is advertised on uh, Minis Forum's uh, motion here that this will work which is what got me interested, right? First, I saw this, and this white text says, with two SSD slots supporting RAID 0 and RAID 1, up to four terabytes of storage for each slot. So it says it supports it right on their own page. However, It also says it supports three screens at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll reach out to my contact at Minis Forum. We've gone about half hour over the normal side uh, time of the video. It's an Adaman G7 PT, and I really want to get RAID 0 working on this. I want to see 20,000 plus megabytes per second sequential read even though it probably won't make much difference in the real world, unless you're just transferring huge files all the time or you're trying to improve your game load times, uh, you know, anytime you're going switching levels, that would probably make a difference you would notice. But then again, just by a few seconds. So <clears throat> let me go back over to camera one here. Turn that off and we'll turn that. So now I have a decision to make. I can leave this as it is. Usually the folks at Miniswarm are quick to get back to me. Let me just unplug it just to make sure that it accidentally turned on. Make sure I understand what my drives are and why they're here. The crucial drive is still empty, the T700. So that can go back in the box, except that I partitioned and formatted it, which means when I use it, I'm going to be like, huh, why does this have a partition on it? I will forget that we use this. But this is the only other Gen 5 drive I've got in inventory. Everything else is Gen 3 or Gen 4. Because they're, you know, way cheaper. And most people aren't going to notice any difference outside of the benchmarks as far as actual real-world performance. So I'm going to put this back on the shelf. I'm going to try and put it back in the box. I think this is supposed to go in this way. So you can see the little... I don't have that camera. It doesn't matter. I just like putting things back the way they were. Okay? It's like a disease. Put it back where it belongs. Then we've got our containers here and our boxes. In case this doesn't work out, I can put all those back too. This has our operating system and everything on it. We can put this in an external dock. We can put that drive in an external dock. Once we have these set up as a RAID 0, we don't do anything to format them. We just set it up in the BIOS. Then we boot from an Acronis bootable rescue disk, and we clone from the external dock onto the RAID 0 drives, which will format, partition them, and do all of that for us during the clone. And then we shut it down, disconnect the external drive, and boot it up, and we're good to go, in theory. There may be some drivers we have to add. That's the theory. OK, so uh, supports Gen 5 on both slots. We've learned that for certain. Uh, the RAID implementation does not appear to be in the BIOS, and if it is, I'm not seeing it. So I'm going to email my contact at Minis Forum, and I'm going to ask for assistance in how to activate the RAID 0 on this model, and we'll pick it up in a part two. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all my members. Thank you guys for your support, your contributions. Um, I have a list here. I hope I have a list here.
Gregory Howard, Jose Lopez, uh, PSC Computers Missouri, 3D Everything, Owlcatcher, and our friend Buster, Peter Laycock, a shout out to him as well as our friend Oystein in Norway, our friend Frankie B in New York. I would be uh, failing you if I didn't remind you we have discounts for Acronis for you guys. That's the software I'm going to use to do this. It's fast. It's easy. We're going to have Acronis on the show Friday. Talk about the new, going back to the name True Image, why and what changes have come of that. And then we're also, uh, once I have the information, we're going to come back and revisit this. Also, a shout out to our friends RoboForm, password management software, 30% off for new customers. And our friends at VIP CDK Deals, if you're looking for a legitimate license code where you're not going to get ripped off, and they do have great customer support, get your licenses for a fraction of what Microsoft sells them for. Why pay more? It's the same license. And everything's guaranteed. I stand behind it personally. What other creator does that? You guys save money. They're happy. And I can stand behind the product knowing it's not ripping you off. And it's something I use myself for my customers. All these Acronis, RoboForm, VIP CDK deals. And I have to have liability and accountability that you don't necessarily have to have. It's good enough for me. And if you find your experience is not what you expect it to be, reach out to their customer support. In a very rare circumstance, if customer support doesn't help you, reach out to me. Buck stops with me. But give them a chance. Everybody makes mistakes, or maybe you made a mistake. Who's to say? Their customer support is excellent at all these companies, Acronis, um, RoboForm, and VIP CDK deals. Just so you know, peace of mind. My thanks to the folks at Minisform for sending us the Adam Man and letting us tear it apart and play around with it. Pretty easy to work on once you know how to open it up. Um, yeah, I, I'm just super excited to get the RAID 0 running and see what the performance of this is going to be. It's mostly just living off of benchmarks. I don't really know that that performance is worth the investment in trouble. But I'm curious. So I can take the journey with or you can join me on my journey so you can determine if it's worthwhile for you to do it once you see what the results are and then you know compare the benchmarks to the reality. Windows isn't going to boot any faster. Most of your applications aren't going to boot any faster that a human being would notice. It would have to be something huge and intense that has long load times that would benefit from that. Anything you connect externally cannot keep up with that. So it's only the internal data transfer where that speed comes in. Otherwise, once you exit your Ethernet port or plug into USB, this is going to be your choke point, and these drives are way overkill for that. So it's just for internal processing only. And if you're not doing any, doing it faster doesn't really make any difference in your life. But if you like looking at benchmarks, well, there you go. All right, that'll wrap it up for me for today. Thank you to Marlena, of course, for all the work she does in the background and hanging in there when we go long on the show like today. And thanks to all my members in, in green for supporting this channel so that we can afford to keep doing this full time and continue bringing you new content, new computers, new concepts, uh, and, and new computer related tech and software to introduce you to it. Without you guys, this channel would not exist. And, or I should say, we'd only be able to do maybe one video a month. So without you guys, all the viewers watching for free would have nothing to watch in this regard. So I hope they appreciate you as much as I do. And we have an amazing community here. You guys are so kind and supportive. I, I can't tell you how much that means to me. It is the most precious and valuable thing we do on this channel is have this community. And I thank each and every one of you for being a part of it. I hope those watching consider supporting us. We're a small operation. We're not a big corporation. And we don't take big corporation sponsorship where they control what I say. I am 100% honest. If you want to see more of that, please support it. Otherwise, you can enjoy the free content as long as other people are supporting it then the viewers can watch it for free. When the support goes away, you know, the viewers will have less to watch. So it works both ways, and uh, this is how it's put together. I try to be as transparent as possible with regards to 
you know, how it's possible to make these videos in such a variety so often. And the secret sauce is the supporters. Thank you so, so much. I'll see you all again very, very soon. And right under the wire there, Peter and Jose have both contributed. Uh, let's see, Jose with a dollar, hey, Peter with a euro. That all adds up. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, you guys. I'll see you all very soon. <laughs> Bye for now. I'm trying to find an outro. We'll do the old classic.